no introduction to computer institutes for information technologies. Yeah, thanks. Um, so uh, at, the, at the second um, symposium, Lee said we should always explain why we're doing this. So I made a list of uh, what it's for. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so the first um, the first reason for analysing Papa Sangre is because of Mike Gatt, who is very persuasive. And also his timing is impeccable, you know, it's just when to ask me to do things. So um, he, he kind of um, just uh, picked up on something I said after the first symposium and just insisted. That's pretty good reason for doing anything, I think. Um, <laughs> but then uh, a more academic reason <coughs> is uh, to open up a field, um, our field, to the analysis of interactive music, which I think is a particular challenge for uh, an out electroacoustic music analysis. But given, you know, that so much of music now is, is interactive, one way or another. I think it's pretty important to think about how we might develop tools for doing that. Uh, and then uh, something that I was particularly interested in, also partly thanks to Bill Brunson, something he said at the first symposium, uh, to offer an experiential alternative to the uh, structuralist approach. And I'm winking at um, Simon here because he accused me of thinking that everybody in the room is a structuralist. And uh, uh, I, I wouldn't put it quite as strongly as that, but certainly most of the uh, analyses I've seen tend towards a structural uh, approach. And I think there's an experiential alternative that, uh, scenario. So I dug out my copy of John Dewey's Art as Experience and um, realized that it had a lot to say uh, about what we're trying to do. Uh, and then also, I wanted to explore the idea that non-music uh, may be musical. Um, so things that don't necessarily call themselves music um, may actually have musical properties. And by the way, I think the, the, the flip side is also true. That there are quite a lot of things that do call themselves music that exhibit surprisingly little musicality. Um, so, but I'll leave that thought with you. Um, and then finally, uh, I got into this area of audio-only gaming that I'm going to talk about, and I found it a fascinating subgenre of gaming that exploits electroacoustic composition techniques. Um, and so that was a particular reason as well for um, focusing on it. Uh, I seem to remember that also came out of the first symposium because I was challenged to uh, talk about what I meant. You probably won't be able to see that slide very well, but we'll get to it in a minute. So uh, I should say as well that, that there's nowhere near enough time to give the whole paper. And I realised with the shot this morning that I had about an hour's worth of material to deliver in, um, in 20 minutes. So uh, I, I'm going to give you a highly compressed version. The full paper is on the RMA website, and I have also have a paper copy here if anybody wants it. But um, it's all on the RMA website. And I should also say uh, that the audio examples I'm going to play are obviously very severely compromised in two main respects. The first is they're captured gameplay, therefore the interactive dimension is not present. Uh, and secondly, this is a binaural um, game. So it's designed to be experienced using headphones. And uh, obviously I'm playing them back in a room across loud speakers. And what's more, in a room that has a lot of um, ambient noise as well. So uh, you probably won't uh, get the full full uh, effect. But anyway, you're sufficiently um, well versed in these matters to be able to fill in the gaps, I hope, uh, mentally. So um, while computer gaming has become an object of ever increasing interest for academic study, game audio is still a relatively under-researched area. And still less research is the area of um, audio-only gaming which is something of a niche activity within gaming itself. Uh, the most important early example was by Kenji Ino, uh, no relation to Brian, um, called Real Sound Has a No Regret, uh, 1999, which was made available on the Sega, Saturn, and Dreamcast platforms. This was aimed at blind gamers who have remained the primary constituency for the genre. Nintendo cottoned onto the idea and produced a series of games from 2006 onwards uh, called Sound Voyager, in which new users navigate using only sound clues. A survey of the audiogames.net website will reveal that this is a flourishing area today with uh, thousands of examples of games designed for both PC and games console. And it's my contention that this kind of gaming provides uh, an opportunity for electroacoustic music analysis. These games deploy a lexicon of musical gestures that will be familiar to most scholars of electroacoustic Furthermore, they emphasize the experiential aspects of the music by blurring the distinction between the composer, the performer, and the audience. The gamer, in effect, becomes all three, uh, shaping and interacting the sonic content through a series of decisions that create highly engaging auditory experience. 
Now, of course, the gamer doesn't necessarily believe that he or she is creating music, but it is hard to argue that the sounds that result from this game are incidental in the way that uh, a soundtrack to a visually based game might be. Uh, we might prefer to call this process self-devised audible design within a set of constraints established by the rules of the game. Uh, but this definition differs from the word music only in terms of its intentionality. Uh, so I think there is clearly an aesthetic dimension to this kind of play. Um, and I should also say the act of gaming involves something which is not often discussed in music analysis, although it has been in the second symposium, which is uh, pleasure. And um, I, in analysing this piece, I've used a, a framework proposed by Bridget Costello. Um, she is a theorist of computational art, primarily visual art, but uh, interactive art. And she put forward this rather interesting collection of 13 um, pleasure principles, if you like, a uh, pleasure framework um, for understanding computer games and interactive art. So um, I hope you can see them, but I'm going to come back to them as I go through the analysis. So um, hopefully some of these will be so, uh, Papa Sangre, uh, this is a first, uh, this is a game for the um, iPhone and the iPad. Uh, it was developed by a team at Something Else Studios, and it was launched in 2010 and rapidly uh, achieved a lot of uh, attention, both uh, for the novelty of the audio only format and for the quality of the sound design and the gameplay. It's a first person game in which the gamer navigates through a virtual world using only oral cues. Movement is enabled by a left-right, left-right touching of the lower half of the screen, corresponding to footsteps. Uh, orientation is adjusted by scrolling the, up, the upper half of the screen. Uh, there are some graphics, there's a pair of feet and a, and a dial that correspond to these regions, but there's no need at all to be able to see these graphics, it's not part of the game. Uh, all the audio in the game is by an oral, as I've said, and was created using either a software engine or by dummy head recording. It's designed to be experienced wearing headphones, and it uses a head-related transfer function to, to calculate variations in sound source characteristics relative to user positions in real time. So it's pretty demanding on the, uh, on the app, <coughs> which is why I've found that it crashes quite often even on the most uh, recent iPhone. It's a bit uh, flaky at times. <coughs> um, so I'm going to look at uh, just two sections of the gameplay in this um, presentation. And I've actually analysed three levels and the whole introductory section, so I'm just going to pick a couple of them uh, to give an example of um, how this works. So if we start with um, something called In the Dark, uh, maybe I'll, I'll just um, play you In the Dark first of all. situates the gamer at the centre of the, of the experience. Uh, the first uh, seven seconds or so introduces what I call the bridging motif, a synthesised texture with an underlying pulsation evoking perhaps distant machinery. And this recurs um, throughout the game subsequently. And it acts as a bridge between levels in the game 
that awaiting sound that nevertheless maintains atmosphere. The distant effect of the low pulsations implies menace. On this occasion, the motif increases in both volume and presence before a short silent break while the game shifts into the intro itself. Um, and then this uh, starts a, a narrative. The central character, the gamer, is heard walking through what seems to be a busy street. Uh, there is background noise of traffic. Some dramatic <coughs> singing is heard, perhaps through an open window, perhaps from a radio. A voice suddenly seems close, desperately crying, somebody help me. Uh, but perhaps it's just a beggar. More jumbled conversation follows, and the telephone is heard ringing in the distance. The gamer seems to walk towards the telephone. Um, a child's voice is heard singing Twinkle Twinkle, becoming especially clear with the phrase, like a diamond in the sky. At 33 seconds, the gamer answers the phone, and hears a man's voice delivering the com comical message that you heard, uh, buenos dias, compañeros, uh, etc. Uh, the message is delivered in this faintly comical Spanish accent. Uh, since the surrounding real world is clearly England, and probably London, judging by the accents of the people who are speaking, uh, this message is evidently coming from somewhere else. The name Papa Sangre immediately conjures up voodoo, uh, the voodoo, voodoo priests are called Papa, and blood, sangre. The humour is underpinned by a sense of menace. At this point, the game will probably have already decided whether or not to suspend disbelief and engage in this fantasy. Uh, notice how the opening sequence has rapidly and cleverly established some key pieces of information. The gamer is identified as someone on a mission who is willing to ignore urgent pleas for help in order to answer a ringing telephone situated presumably in a public phone box in a busy street. It has also been established that the normal world is full of strangeness. The singing and the child's voice suggest the fantasy elements of the coming experience. The unanswered ringing phone is itself uncanny, and the street noises are also not at all reassuring. Many of the key elements of pleasure identified by Costello are already here. Exploration, discovery, uh, danger, captivation, fantasy. I'll just share that previous slide again. Uh, refer to those, okay. Uh, it's by playing with the idea of sympathy, however, that the game establishes its major hook. Who am I that I will ignore pleas for help? Where do my sympathies lie? This is the initial enigma. The other important aspect of this intro is that it establishes that this is an electro <coughs> world. Of course, the game already knows that Papa Sangre is an audio-only game, but the purpose of the intro is to prepare and awaken the senses to the creative potential that this represents. The sense of navigation that is crucial to the gameplay is established by the sound of footsteps and the direction of travel towards the ringing phone. The rest of the composition is pure soundscape with keynote sounds of traffic and, hus and bustle, the various sound signals, the singing, the desperate man, the child, the telephone. Following the telephone message then, we must leave this world with its obvious sonic signifiers of normal daily life and plunge into the fantasy kingdom of Papa Sangre, which is an entirely electroacoustically composed play. The intro represents this change by a move to more abstract sounds from 24 seconds onwards, which follows a classic spectrum of morphological pattern of accumulating highly textured synthesizer suites leading to a falling gesture. Once again, this establishes a sense of background and foreground, combined with forward motion as the accumulation leads to a significant event. The density and scope of the suites also maps out the acoustic terrain, demonstrating to the gamer that the entire 360 degree stereo field, perceived both horizontally and vertically, will be made available in this game. The gesture concludes with a sound effect that is seamlessly blended into the more abstract content, but which re-establishes the presence of the gamer, who falls with an oof sound onto the floor of this ambiguous, sonorous space. The fall is accompanied by sounds of similar falling objects, which seem to have been scattered as the gamer lands. Given the preceding action, we may infer that these are the bones strewn about the place. Evidently, the kingdom of Papa Sangre is down there somewhere, scary and full of death. Uh, now the first level that I've analysed of actual gameplay, um, rather than pre-composed material, is um, the Palace of Bones. 
that what I'm going to play is the second attempt I made to um, play this level. I just tried to play as well as I could, and, uh, but unfortunately the first time I played, this, the app crashed about halfway through. So this is my second attempt. I managed to get through this level in, in just under three minutes, so um, uh, I, I, I reckon I was pretty good at this at this stage. Uh, it turned out later, by the way, that I was pretty rubbish, actually. <laughs> At this level, it worked quite well. Yeah. Okay, here we go. You are at the entrance to the Palace of Bones. It is guarded by a hog. The hog is asleep in the kennel, next to a musical note. The hog will eat you if it catches you. If you trip and fall, the hog will wake and chase you. Exit. Of height is only created by the echoing of the footsteps. 
which seem somewhat dislocated from the imagined environment. Their reverberation characteristics, which never change, suggest a rather empty, cavernous space, whereas the hog and note seem to exist in a much smaller space. Since these footsteps are the only indicator of one's own presence in the space, it is also somewhat unsettling to realize that their reverberation is the same, however close to the walls one may come. There are, there are clearly technical reasons for this. Recomputing the reverberation pattern for each individual location would place an impossible strain on the engine. But there's also a certain pleasure to be had from this apparent failure of simulation. Uh, by emphasizing the cartoon-like nature of the footsteps, which seem to be taken uh, taken wearing hard shoes, or perhaps Cuban heels, uh, walking on an echoing surface. We are constantly reminded that this is a game and we're in, in an imaginary landscape. It takes very little time to suspend disbelief. Absolute verisimilitude is probably not a requirement in a computer game. The musical note is discovered quite quickly, uh, 1 minute 19 seconds in fact, uh, uh, on my first attempt, and 53 seconds on my second attempt. The main pleasure in this level is the sense of danger in proximity to the snoring hog. How close may we come without being detected? The specialization effectively conveys the fine detail of the navigation, and the keynote synthesizer ambience, which has now established itself as a, as a drone, helps to maintain a sense of atmosphere. Notice how the footsteps include the sound of a second foot coming to rest in almost military fashion uh, when the gamer stops walking. No running is attempted in this level. Later levels you very hard to Finding the exit is the toughest challenge. One must navigate towards a pair of glockenspiel-like spread cords which steadily alternate in attractive fashion, accompanied by a knock-on-wood sound, five rhythmic knocks, that suggests the door. Both recorded attempts contain instances of hitting a wall, which is rather cleverly accompanied by a haptic clue as the iPhone actually vibrates in your hand. This passage of play, uh, which is about um, two minutes in the second attempt, is the point at which the game's narrative is, is suspended, and for the first time, the gamer is navigating through purely acoustic space, with only sonic cues as a guide. The electroacoustic <coughs> elements for this first level are deliberately sparse. The exit sounds, the drones, the footsteps, and occasionally the wall. Localization is carefully indicated by accurate binaural imaging. Impressively, this seems to work at the level of a single step in a given direction. Nevertheless, the exit sound effects do create some sense of dislocation as, as one's direction changes. The move from one position to the next is not entirely smooth. From an aesthetic point of view, this episode is intriguing. On one level, it seems to offer the least satisfactory experience, since the musical materials are so sparse and the structure is so variable. It is also the case that one is by now immersed in the gameplay aspects and therefore barely paying attention to this as potential electroacoustic music. Indeed, why would one want to do so? Yet it is now, as the moment when one is finally in charge of the game, that the sense of gameplay assert asserts itself most strongly and the idea of enjoying the soundscape for more than just its narrative shrive begins to appear. It's a question of agency. For the first time, the game's makers have left us in a pleasurable acoustic environment without obviously captivating controls. The hog is sleeping, the FWT is silent, we may take as long as we like. It will be observed that the pace of movement in both attempts is slow. This is, for me, was the aesthetic effect kicking in and somewhat overriding the rules of the gameplay. Finally, the exit is found and accompanied by some joyous chimes and heavenly choirs uh, synthesized, um, and relief is obviously the, the intended emotion. So, um, I've, oh, well, I've over, overstayed my welcome. Okay, I'll have to leave the, uh, I was going to come on to apply the pressure principles in detail, but we have no time, so stop there. You can read it all on the paper. <laughs> Thank you. towards an analysis because right. um, I simply haven't had the time to really do this in the way that I'd like to do it. Yeah. I mean, clearly, uh, you'd want multiple users 
all the experience from the game, capture all their interactions, uh, interview them all in a probably in our usability lab so that you can observe eye tracking and you know, well, actually eye tracking in the case it won't. But anyway, capture their interactions generally uh, in detail and analyze that data. So I mean, there's a, there's a hell of a lot more that can be done with this. And the pleasure framework itself is quite <coughs> broad based. I think there's more to be done. <coughs> So uh, really, what I'm all, all I'm trying to do with this is just point a point away, and hopefully um, either I'll get time or some funding to research it properly, or um, other people will get excited and 